We now look at the Catholic ethical principle of cooperation. So co cooperation is understood as any concrete help given that is given to another in the commission of what one judges to be moral. So what does that mean? So this is a way of trying to sort of parse out the way you can assign culpability or blame in cases where um, someone has a relationship with the principal agent, someone who's committed an immoral act, right? There are cases where um, someone is somewhat related to that and does something that that aids in that, but it's not part of the evil act, act. And you have cases where people sort of join in, and you want to be able to make distinctions there. So in terms of our definition here, um, so cooperation is understood as any concrete help. That's when you do something, right? You help someone who is in the process of committing an immoral act. So if you think of an example here, let's say I have, an, I have a friend whose name is Fred, and I'm hanging out at university, and Fred comes to me and tells me he wants to go rob First Bank, which is on 2nd Street, just outside the university. And I tell him, no, I, I don't want to do that. Right? Um, and he says, okay, fine. And he comes back an hour later and says, uh, can you give me a ride to First Bank, uh, which is on 2nd Street? And I say, okay. And I give him a ride, and he asked me if I could not park, but just wait for him right outside the door, keep the car running. Uh, he'll be back in five minutes, and sure enough, in five minutes, he's back running out of the door with a bag. And he asks for a ride home, and I give him a ride home. So to what degree then, well, obviously he robbed the bank. So to what degree am I culpable here? Because I just simply drove a friend to, to the bank. I waited for him. I drove him back. I have no idea what he did in that building. And sure, yeah, it's a little weird that he comes out with a bag that he didn't take in with him, but, you know, I, people do that all the time, I suppose. Right, so in what way am I culpable there, right? So let's say um, I said no, I was not going to drive him to the bank, and he then took the bus. And so we could ask the question, to what degree is the bus driver uh, culpable, right? And when she drove him there, she in some way she gave him um, aid in the commission of this act, which was immoral. So is she culpable in any way? How do we understand that relationship? Okay, so this is what cooperation helps us parse out. So there's formal cooperation and this material cooperation. Formal cooperation, uh, we'll see what that is, but usually when you see the word formal in a lot of Catholic theology, it tends to um, mean have something to do with intent. So you can imagine uh, in this case, it would be cooperation that in some way has the idea of intent involved in it. And then material cooperation. So material usually has to do with matter or something physical or tangible, right? So you can get a sense of, of what that kind of cooperation would be. So in terms of our definitions, uh, principal agent is the person who's committed the immoral act, and the cooperator is the person who aids the principal agent. So formal cooperation is when either, so there's two ways you can have formal cooperation. So uh, if you aid the principal agent fully, so that's you, you, you agree fully, um, explicitly or implicitly with the principal's intention. So that means my friend Fred, if I'm like, yes, I, I want to do this, I want in 30% of the, you know, things you steal, um, I'm explicitly in, right? Now, um, also, but I might implicitly be in. I may not say it explicitly, but I'm like, okay. And I don't say, yes, I'm with you. And I just participate in it, right? So it could be explicit or implicit, but the idea is that I, in terms of intent, I agree with what's going on. Now, on the other hand, um, you might have a case where I don't necessarily express any implicit or explicit intent. I mean, so I, I don't internally maybe say to myself, oh, I want to do this. And I don't certainly don't explicitly say that, but you could have formal cooperation. So using this bank example, let's say, um, so let me read uh, this. When the cooperator performs an essential part of the evil action under the direction of the principal agent, right? So that's also formal cooperation. So it could be, what if I decide, I, I don't say anything to my friend Fred, I just say, okay, fine, I'll, I'll drive you to the bank. 
So I drive him in and he says, can you come in with me? And I'm like, sure, I'll come in. And when we get in, you know, he tells everyone this is a stick up or, you know, bank robbery or whatever. And he hands me a, a gun and says, hey, point it at this guard here. And if he moves, you know, shoot him or something. Um, and so, you know, he then goes to tell him, gets all the money, and then we both walk on and I drive him home. So I've performed an essential part of his own action, even though I've not explicitly um, said anything, or even implicitly, I may not have said, oh, I want to be part of this, but ultimately I performed an essential part of the evil action, and so that is formal cooperation. So formal cooperation is never morally justified. Right? You cannot, you can never intend to do evil. That's never, never, never morally justified. Now, material cooperation is when one does an act that is good in itself, but that act is abused by another to do evil. Right? So, the bus driver who drove uh, my friend Fred to the bank was simply doing her job. She was doing, you know, she did a good job. She did a good thing, and he used that. He abused that to do evil. Okay, so um, material cooperation is mediated if the action is distinct and separate from the evil act. So the bus driver who just did her thing, she drove the bus, dropped him off, and went on, right? So it's material cooperation. She did aid him in his act, but her action was distinct, distinct and separate from the evil act. And in that case, there's, you know, there's no culpability there, but we just... We want to be able to recognize sometimes the relationships that do happen. The fact that that there are actions that are that led up to a particular evil act, even if those people are not culpable, it does help to know and be able to parse that out. Now, there's remote mediated uh, material cooperation, approximate mediated material cooperation. Um, just a quick note: remote means distance, proximate always means close, right? But um, uh, so there are two different kinds of uh, mediated um, material cooperation. Now, um, so we've talked about material co cooperation that's mediated. Okay, then there's the immediate material cooperation. So you think about the idea of immediate. That's something that's uh, happens right there and then. And it's a way of saying that there is no distance between you know two things, right? So in this case, we're saying the cooperator in some way, it's just very little moral distance between what they're doing and what the principal immoral agent is doing. So immediate moral cooperation is when the moral object of the cooperator's act is indistinguishable from that of the principal agent. Right, so this is when, um, and it really is in equivalent to implicit formal cooperation. Okay, so uh, a case where someone is cooperating, um, they don't explicitly or implicitly agree with the principal um, moral, immoral agent, um, but their actions are indistinguishable overall when you look at the overall thing. So let's think about this. Um, torture, let's say, is intrinsically evil. So let's say um, I am in the room where someone is being tortured, and the torturer is really doing whatever you know torture torturers do. And it's sort of my task to make sure that the torturer, the person doing the torturing, um, is well hydrated and has all the snacks that they want, and they're always comfortable. And so I'm there watching the torture, and when I see him getting tired from torturing or he seems dehydrated or it seems like he needs a rest, I run and get him some water, get some snacks, maybe get a washcloth so he can cool himself down before he goes back to torturing. So ultimately, I'm not torturing that. I may not even have a stance on, on torturing, but my actions there in that situation um, are just in, indistinguishable from that of the principal agent, right? Because I'm just basically part of that entire situation. And um, anyone from the outside will just clearly see me as part of as part of that, right? So what I'm doing is my material cooperation, even though I'm doing good things like helping someone get rehydrated and helping someone get snacks and helping someone be comfortable, those are good things in themselves, right? But my this is immediate material cooperation because I'm doing that in the service of someone who is torturing, okay? So um, in that case, it's equivalent to formal cooperation okay so um, 
so really the only sort of material cooperation that's is fine is when it's mediated that means um, someone you, you know you do your thing which is distinct and it's separate from the evil act um, you know someone sort of uses it to accomplish your evil act but you have nothing to do with it and, it, and you you know your own or that person who is materially co cooperating in that way um, subsequently goes on their own way and, and does whatever it is they, they're doing, right? So they're distinct and separate from the evil act, okay? So that's the uh, principle of cooperation. Again, it helps us sort out uh, the relationships, how to morally assess uh, the relationships between principal agents, people committing immoral acts, and people who aid them in various ways.